So it's not really the largest chip microchip mix. Um, it's an 8-bit processor, but this is the largest one I can actually use. This is a 40-pin chip, and as you can see, it's the type that be, can be used in a, um, a breadboard or a perf board. The uh, other chips that are much larger, up to 100 pins, by the way, are surface mount, and they require a um, special socket and a special hardware that I don't actually have. Most people who are in the hobbyist category do not have this, the hardware to make a surface mount chip work, but the 40 pin chip is as large as you can get. And that's this right here. I picked this chip actually because it was actually the cheapest 40 pin chip I could find. And um, with that being said, this here is um, an old standby. A lot of people use these ones right here. This is a uh, 12F675. It's probably one of the smaller chips that microchip makes as a microcontroller. And this one right here is um, a 18F46Q10. The difference between these two chips, uh, for starter, for price, uh, this is a buck 25. This is one dollar more. So just one extra dollar, and you get a very large chip compared to something like that. So for a dollar, what do you get? Is it worthwhile thinking about doing building projects with something like this for one extra dollar for two dollars and twenty-five cents? Well, that's what we're going to explore. I'm going to build a program with you as well and we will test it out and see how it works on a perf board or actually a breadboard um, at five volts and uh, let's see first of all this is 10 years newer right here um, this is from 2020 this is from 2010 and um, six io ports versus 36 io ports and this one runs at only four megahertz internal oscillator this one over here will run at um, anything from 64 megahertz all the way down to 31 kilohertz. And it has a very wide range in the sense that you can have, I think it's like 12 or 15 different stops along the way, all the way down um, from 64. They can go down to 48 megahertz or 32 or 12 or 16 megahertz. Um, then yeah, you can, you can do a lot of different types of oscillator speeds, internal that is. Um, Another thing is, okay, the advantage of this, of course, it doesn't take up much uh, uh, breadboard real estate. This one does, much larger, much larger, really. And this one is actually very easy to learn. Uh, 136 pages versus 781 pages. That's a lot of information. But realistically, you probably only read uh, 40 pages before you feel like you can program with this because a lot of stuff you may not use. You may not use a lot of the co more complex things inside here so you might only use maybe 40 pages of material when you're programming this this over here you might use maybe closer to 60 pages of material um, to program this and uh, actually we're going to jump around maybe six or eight pages and we'll look at what this does and there's a few concepts in this chip that are new compared to this and the previous generations um, what else uh, 35 instructions inside here the instruction set is 35 instructions. This one here is 75. This instruction set includes a couple multiplication features. So you can multiply a couple 8-bit uh, registers. And by the way, they're both 8-bit processors. Um, and this one actually uses a 16-bit uh, instruction. And this one uses a 14-bit instruction. And I think we'll probably look at the data sheet right now and see... What? Well, actually, no, wait, let, we're going to build a project. So I'm going to just show you um, what we're going to build. So I think we um, start off with a schematic here. And uh, what is this? The 18F46Q10. So we're going to have one input and one output because I want to show how they both work. And um, I think the input will be a button, <clears throat> that one right there. And the output is going to be um, going straight out to my oscilloscope because what I'll do is I'll get this processor running at 64 megahertz and I will send a signal out from it <clears throat> um, through port A bit zero. And that will be attached to my oscilloscope and I'll watch and see what the signal looks like. Um, and I'll turn the 
the port on and off as fast as I can. We'll see if the signal looks pretty or not. So that's gonna be RA0 or port A bit zero. And that's going out to the oscilloscope. I wonder, did you think that's the right way to spell that? I don't know. <clears throat> Probably close enough. Anyhow, so that's actually on pin two and we're gonna go over to pin three, which is the next pin right over, um, RA1. And that's gonna be bit one, port A. And we're gonna put a little push button on that. So here's my little <laughs> drawing of a push button. Um, and we'll take it straight to ground. So um, the way this works is the push button goes to ground. When you push the button, it will force pin three to zero. And of course, pin three is the location for port A, bit one. Now, usually you have a, a resistor going to positive voltage so that there's obviously a positive power on there. We're gonna actually have an internal pull-up resistor uh, activated here. And that's a, a, a feature that this chip will do. It's called a weak pull-up resistor. And I'm gonna put it on port A bit one. So this will be my input, this will be my output, and that is it. So I'm gonna add some electricity to here, about five volts, actually probably closer to six volts because it's um, four AA batteries. So that's what, uh, four times 1.5, about six volts. And of course it's gonna go to ground. Uh, so this, oh wait, this will probably be, um, uh, probably pin 11, I think, and this is probably pin 12 is the ground or the VSS. Okay, that's our project. And so, yeah, so the signal that's coming out to the, to the oscilloscope will look something like this. It'd be just a constant on, off, on, off, and it would be better than the way I drew it. <laughs> so um, that'll be five volts. It'll turn that bit on, and then it'll turn it off down to zero volts. And we'll capture that with an oscilloscope that I have over here. Actually, it's a, um, a PC oscilloscope. I think I bought it for like $75. And it's always nice to test out something like that. I've used it a little bit and it kind of works okay. Um, yeah, there's our project and that's the schematic. And we will look at the data sheet right now. So let's go over to the data sheet. So I'm going to, um, look at the data sheet which is over here it's all free by the way the data sheets from microchip are free so is the um the the platform for developing all this stuff it's free as well the only thing you pay for is of course the chips and the um the, the chip programmer the chip programmer is about 40 dollars or 30 bucks i can't quite remember the chips like i mentioned that one there the big monster was like two and a half bucks the little one was like um actually 125 and 225 two dollars and 25 cents first so anyhow this um data sheet as they call it for the pic uh, 18f46 it obviously has about three chips being explained in this one data sheet and it's 781 pages so that's how they usually start off. They explain all the neat things they can do, but I'm actually looking for the pinout. I just want to show you. It's probably about page six, right down here. So on page six, you can see, this is the pinout of this 40 pin monstrosity. So as you can see, there's 36 IO ports. Um, by the way, number one, pin number one, that IO port is actually only an input port so that everything else can be either input or output based on how you program this chip. And we will do that in this here amazing video. So if you remember, I said I was gonna do a, a um, what's it, a, an output in RA0 or in bit zero port eight. And you can see that's on pin two. And I was going to do a push button or an input on RA0 one, which is obviously pin three, and that will be the two pins we use, as well as pin 11 and pin 12 are gonna be my 
power, five volts and ground right there. That's all we're gonna do. That's your pinout right there, fairly straightforward. So let's run over to um, the instruction set. That'd be kind of interesting to see the instruction set. Um, over here in this data sheet, way down here, a gazillion miles down, where is the instruction? Oh, there it is, way down there. Um, okay, so I want you to notice something here. There's actually a reason for me wandering over here besides just having fun. <laughs> okay, so if you've worked with a microchip microcontrollers, you'll notice, um, well, let me just skim down here a little bit farther. Oops, wrong way. Let me, um, yeah, let me skim down just a little bit farther. I wanna show you um, some of the, the instructions. This is your typical group of instructions. There's like 75 of them, but I'm just showing you a, a little batch of them right here. If you notice, there's this A at the end of all of these instructions. So it's an attribute um, of each instruction. So like even the clear file register, you obviously put the file register you wanna clear in the F spot right there. And then the A spot right here, you put something. <laughs> what is that something you're saying, right? Well, that's what I'm gonna talk about. This is gonna be the um, something that you should probably understand because it's kind of new to this series of microchip uh, microcontrollers. And what it is, is they've been, um, well, microchip uses banking for all of their, um, all of their registers. So you wanna register that you're gonna work with or they usually bank them into several banks. Um, that tiny little chip I showed you, it had two banks. This big one here that we were, we're working on, it has 16 banks. So out of those 16 banks, um, there's a variety of special function registers and there's a, a variety of registers you can do whatever you want with. And they, they call that um, general purpose registers. And um, this A will determine what you're gonna use. And I will explain a little bit more, but it's called an um, A4 access RAM. So if you, it's kind of funny, but when A is zero, you access this um, virtual access RAM. But if A is one, you access the registers in the bank that is controlled by the bank select register. Okay, so that might make no sense to you right yet, but we're gonna dig at this a little bit more. And now I just want you to know that there is something new there. If you've worked with um, microchip microprocessors, you know there's something odd here. A is a foreign thing perhaps, um, but anyhow, Let's run over to a uh, register summary. Um, we already did that, didn't we? Um, no, we didn't. Um, let's go over there to page 605 for a second here. Okay, so <clears throat> the register summary here, why does it look like, okay, we'll just go with that and see if it's all working. Okay, so, um, there's 16 banks, as mentioned. Uh, this situation here, we have 14 banks that were, um, had just your own general purpose registers, but the last two register banks, or last two uh, banks, yeah, register banks, um, bank E and bank F, both have uh, all the special purpose registers inside them. So bank E, you can see we're starting here about bank E register one F, all the way down, there will be all these special function registers to do with a variety of things with the um, the chip. Um, they have like here's five right here that do something to do with watchdog timer. They control the watchdog timer. Here's another five or eight, actually eight, I guess, that control the oscillator to change the speed of the oscillator and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, you, you just keep. Um, you'll find that all of the special function registers are in bank E and bank F. As we wander down here, oh, we're gonna actually work with these two right here. The weak pull-up resistors for port A, which is bank F, register B. Uh, we're gonna work with that. We're gonna pull up one of the um, um, ports, and actually I believe it's port one, I mean port A bit one was gonna be our push button, right? So we're gonna put a um, a one on that single pull-up bit or pull-up 
yeah, bit, I guess. And it will raise or activate the pull up resistor on that input. Um, actually, interesting enough, the, the one right below it, this um, register right below, the NCL A, we are going to use that as well. And what that does is that um, all the chips from microchip come from the factory set up as analog chips. All the ports in all the chips, the microchips are set up as analog ports. So we want to change it to digital so we can use it as a digital chip. Um, so we're going to change that setting. And to do that, you just simply clear that register. So we're going to clear that register to allow that register, um, that port to be a digital port. Now let's go down and same thing with port B down here. You'd, you'd set up your analog select B, you'd zero it out and it'd be a digital port from there on in. Um, and you'd also have obviously port C, port D, port E. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, 36 um, IO bits. That's a lot of stuff. You can do a lot of neat things, but it's a lot of um, special function registers to control that. Okay, down here you can see obviously we have the latches for port A, B, C, D, and E. And of course, um, the control, TRIS is the control to determine whether you're gonna have that bit an input or an output. So in which case, I'm gonna do some adjustments to TRIS A here. So I want, um, I want all of the entire port to be output except for one bit. Um, the one bit being bit one, port A bit one will be my input my push button right so that would be that one right here so that's going to be an input everything else is going to be output the way you designate this is uh, if you want it to be an input you make that bit a one if you want it to be an output you make that bit a zero so as you can see here in this example that we're doing we're going to have all zeros everywhere and a one right here on bit one and then a zero there so that's going to come out to the value zero two yeah so i'm going to put two right in this register here and on in the program i mean <laughs> so um here is port b c and d as well so down here ports um there's ports a b c d e we're going to then want to um maybe look at port a bit one see if someone's pushed a button so port A, this is where we look, right here. So down here on port A, bit one, over here, is where we're gonna to look to see if the push button has been pushed. So obviously, if there's a weak pull-up resistor holding the port high, or at five volts, whatever, then we're looking for when it finally goes down to zero volts or low. And that port, right there, that bit right there actually, will go low when I finally push that button. So it'll stay high until I push that button. And we'll be watching that with our program. And when we finally see it go low, we'll know that we can now uh, proceed to maybe send some signal out through uh, port A bit zero, which is right here. Um, like I said, I'm just gonna send out a bunch of pulses of highs and lows just so we can see what they look like. And then when I remove my, my push button or I release the push button, then I'll stop, I'll, I'll allow the program to stop sending signals to port A bit zero right there. So that's where we do our activity to send information out and receive stuff in. I think, same with BCDE right here, you can do that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so what else are we looking for? I think that's about all we're gonna do in this simple little program. Maybe it'll be a dozen pieces of code, not a lot. Um, but yeah, you can see down here, just wandering down a little bit here, you can see this is the control for timer one. And, um, oh, there's your bank select register right there. And there's your status register right there. And we have the working register right down here. And, uh, oh, even the, um, the result from a multiplication is, or yeah, multiplication is right here, the product. <laughs> Way down here on bank F, F3. So um, what I wanna show you right now is, um, give me a second number, is a, a map of 
the registers. And I know I'm jumping around a lot. This will be up here at about page 117 or something like that. So this is a typical, um, the data memory map. And um, we're actually 46Q10, that's our processor we're using. So that's the, the little map right there. As you can see, as I said, there is 16 banks. Um, bank 0H, H is hexadecimal, all the way down to bank F in hexadecimal, right down there. And um, the green represents um, general purpose registers. They're just wide open for anything you want to do with them. Um, if you, if you need um, a register for doing some additions and calculations and stuff, <laughs> you, you've got 3000 bytes to work with. That's quite a few, hey? Um, down here, the blue ones, of course, like I said, are the special function registers in the last two banks, banks E and bank F. And what's happening, this access bank that we were talking about earlier, um, what it does, it's a virtual bank. It's not really a, <clears throat> A bank per se it's not like bank 17 or anything um, what it does is it grabs uh, about the first 96 bytes from bank 0 and then it grabs the last mm, 160 bytes from bank F and it sticks them both together and calls that the access bank so what that's all about is the access bank has all the most popular special function registers right here, as well as a, a bunch of general purpose registers that you can use for whatever you want. Um, it kind of grabs the best of both worlds. And in doing this, it saves a lot of jumping around between the banks, because if you've ever programmed with these chips, you're constantly jumping from bank to bank, trying to get um, the special function registers you needed for something, and then you, your general purpose registers you need for something else. And this makes it easier to get around. Um, is, it's actually a good idea. It's a little confusing when it's a brand new concept, but that's what it does. We will be using the virtual access bank on some of our programming, but we also need to use um, some other parts of bank F, um, which is beyond the reach of the virtual access bank. And we'll have to do that as well. So it's actually the stuff we need. We need a few um, special function registers that are inside the virtual access bank, but we also need to do um, some accessing of the bank F, but the higher or the lower uh, registers in it that aren't reached by this 60 through to FF. But anyhow, um, let me see what we're doing here. We have just... Um, yeah, I think we'll, that'll be good enough. I think we'll stop right there. Let's go over to the uh, program. We'll start doing our thing. So um, I am going to go to um, my program. Okay, so this is MPLAB XIDE version 5.2. It's free again, as usual. And it's just that I'm doing programming in assembler or assembly language and it is much easier on version 5.2. So that's why I'm using that version, if you're curious. So let's see here, <clears throat> starting up. So what do we see here? Let me get rid of a few things here. Um, unclickify <laughs> everything here. So, um, if you're new to uh, microchip microcontrollers, there's a few things you have to kind of do before you can even start to code, before you start typing in your code. You kind of have to set up your configuration bits. Um, actually, what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna start off, I'm sorry, let's take it even one step newer. You first have to set up your, your, um, your project. So we're gonna do that. So you can come over here and click on this for a brand new project. And then you run over to here and say, it's going to be a standalone project next. And then you're going to say, what processor are you going to use? Our microcontroller, I should say. And we're going to use an 18F46Q10. Um, there it is right there. Um, and click next. 
<laughs> click next and it doesn't move. Um, anyhow, I'm using a PicKit 3. By the way, I'm also using a Windows 10 based computer. Um, you can use a, Win a PicKit 4 if you want. There's a variety of um, development platforms or actually tools that you can use. And next, and our compilers, there's our compiler right there for this particular version of Windows or MP Lab. And my project name, I'm going to call it um, Test 28. So there we go, Test 28. Um, next, well, finished, I guess, is the next word. So what happens is you have a bunch of file folders over here. And I'm going to uh, right click and left click on a new simple assembly program. Okay, so this is going to be called, um, for lack of a better idea, test 28 and finished. Okay, so um, just a bunch of junk. I'm just going to clear this out. I'm going to um, back it out or clear it out and it's gone. So what we have to do here is we first have to do what we call configuration bit setup. And that is just something you do when you have to um, set up your chip so that it's running a certain way. Like, do you want an external oscillator or an internal oscillator? Do you want it to be code protected or not? Did you want to have a watchdog timer or not? Did you want all these attributes that you can set up right here? Click on production, go down to set configuration bits. And these are all the little bits we're gonna set. There's, I don't know, 20 of them probably. But um, we will run through quickly and it'll only take us a minute or two. So I'm going to say I do not want an external oscillator. I do want to have an internal one and I want it to be fast. I want this high frequency internal oscillator, 64 megahertz right there. I'm going to use that one. Everything else I'm going to just turn off. I have, um, it's very simple to turn all these, these things off just by running down and clicking them all off. You don't really need them for this project, a very simple project. You know, a lot of these things do all sorts of, um, things that you actually can activate while you're in the program anyhow, if you wanted to. Like um, the watchdog timer, you can actually turn that on if you want. Um, and the code protection. Actually, can you turn code protection on when you're inside? I can't quite remember that. Um, and same with low voltage programming. But anyhow, there is a lot of stuff that you can turn off um, and on while you're inside the chip. But uh, I usually just turn off all the things I'm not using right here. Um, brownout protection, I turn that off. I don't need it. I don't care for it. Write protections or power up. Um, timer is kind of nice. Um, here we go. So we've got it all set up. The only thing I changed was I made it an internal oscillator of 64 megahertz. So we're going to generate some source code right here. And we're going to cut and paste this or copy and paste this entire thing into our program. So copy. And just get rid of this stuff off your screen right here. It's in the way. Um, so I'm gonna paste it at the very top here. There's the paste. And that's all the stuff to do with how you're gonna tell the compiler to treat the, um, the chip. So I'm gonna, first, there's one more uh, thing I wanna add here. Um, I'm just gonna give a directive to tell where I want the code to go. I want to go in um, location zero, zero in the program memory. And now we're basically ready to rock and roll. You don't need spaces. I throw spaces in stuff just because I want to separate code directives and stuff like that. Uh, it's just what I do. So I'm going to type out a little bit of code and we'll talk about it once I get it typed out just um, so we can uh, make sense out of this. Um, And a lot of times um, what I do is I do put spaces in for certain reasons. Like I did add ex extra space over here so I can put a label in this area. And I do actually put um, a space between all the instructions and all the um, data that it works with, okay? So I, I do that as a, other people don't, but I do, you can 
choose to decide how you want to write your programs, but I'm just doing it this way and you can kind of get an idea what you want to do. So. Oops, I forgot the, I did not spell that instruction correctly. Maybe I'll just do it that way. <laughs> okay, so where was I? Um, move W into file register, trist A. Um, I don't know. What do you think of that? Um, well, I think I also oops, forgot this and that looks pretty good. So, um, these are the first five pieces of code or instruction, if you will, uh, for this program. And, um, I'm just double checking everything. Just, you know, it's always nice to be right. Um, okay. So this right here, the first instruction move literal into banking register. That's what that means. So it's actually moving, um, the value F into the banking register. Um, obviously we've just now shifted our banking register over to F and that's where we're going to draw our, um, our registers from basically out of the pool of 15 or 16, well, 16 banks. We're going to draw them from the F bank down here. Um, clear file register. So now we're in the F bank. Uh, we're going to draw our, we're going to actually clear out file register and cell A, which happens to be the analog select byte or register, if you remember. And we're actually going to make that um, all zeros in order to make the whole thing a digital IO port or make port A digital IO. Um, the one right here was the A thing I was talking about. That right there um, makes it so I'm, I'm actually um, drawing from the register bank here in order to uh, decide which registers to manipulate. So right here, move literal into W. It's moving a number two into the working register and down to the next line down here, move the W or the working register into file register Tris A. So I'm basically putting a two into Tris A and Tris A is the register that um, decides how the ports are going to be programmed. So obviously I've programmed it just now with this instruction to do a whole bunch of outputs and one input. The one input of course is bit one port A. So the next one down here, bit set file register. My bit set file register. Uh, what that does is this is the WPUA stands for weak pull up resistors of port A. <laughs> wow, that's a mnemonic and a half. Um, so what's that that's doing is it's going to set bit one of that register. So it's going to set a weak pull up resistor on bit one, which is of course bit one of port A. And the reason why I have a, a one at the end is I had to draw from a gain from the, um, the, the bank select register up here, bank F, because I could not find it in. If, if these were zeros, I'd be looking, it would mean that I'm actually looking in the uh, virtual bank, which actually that this, um, these two special function registers are just outside of the virtual bank range. They're way down at the bottom of bank F outside of the range of what the virtual bank actually looks at. So I had to use that to program the, um, right there, the ones. So anyhow, I'm going to do a little bit more typing here and I'm going to add a, Hey, you know something? I think I need kind of, um, yeah, I don't, can I do, um, yeah, very small. I'll use a very small, um, label. How about like, um, hi, no, I can't. No, I just go, um, how about L O as in loop? Would that be good enough? Um, usually I space everything over to the right, at least another tab. And then I can type out stuff in that space. I, Oh, but Hey, maybe I'll do that. Why not? You say, right? So tab, tab, 
tab, tab, tab. I can finish typing out the whole word loop. It does not need to be the word loop. It can be anything that you think is a nice word to use. Oops, here we go. Tab, here we go. So I'm going to type out a little bit more code here and we'll talk about it. Uh, There you go. So those two instructions, um, probably this isn't all that bad. So. so those two instructions right there, um, this is going to be a trap for catching the, um, the keystroke or the push button, I mean. So it's saying basically bit test, uh, file register, well, port A, and skip if it's clear. So it's actually going to be bit testing bit one of port A. And if it's clear, it's going to skip over this command and go down to here. And um, obviously, if I'm not pushing the push button, it will be high. That bit on port A, bit 1, will be high until I push that button and pull the uh, bit 1 port A low. But in the meantime, it's going to be high and it will continuously go around in circles here. Because it says go to loop or go to the label loop, which is over here. And you can see it's going to go around in circles until I finally hit that, that push button and pull it down. Let me pull it down and it'll go over here. So then I will write some code that I want to be done, which is sending the uh, waveform out to port A bit zero. And this is what I'm going to write. I'm going to bit clear file register port A bit zero. So you can see I've just pulled that port, that bit on that port low, which is actually port A bit zero. And then what do you think I'm going to do next? I'm going to take port A uh, bit zero and I'm going to set it with that command bit set here. Let's go more. Uh, I'll bit set that command or that bit. So I'm pulling it low and then high. And I think I'll do that a few times because um, doing, oops, Doing it a few times, you actually um, create a faster waveform, believe it or not. And you'll see what I mean when it's uh, running. It'll make good sense. Um, give me a few seconds here. I'll just do my fancy one finger typing. <laughs> So what do we got here? Clear, set, clear, set, clear, set. Okay, that's good enough for me. Uh, that's enough. Um, then I just go to the loop again. So we're done. Now I'm going to add um, an end. You always have to add an end to every program so that the compiler knows you've come to the end of your program. And so let's have a look at this. Um, yeah, so it's going it, to, the, the moment I finally release my finger off of that button, it will stop and stay stuck here again. The moment I push the button, of course, it'll run through all this and back up, all this, back up, and it'll continuously do this. You'll find though, um, there's actually a certain amount of delay when you change direction on the, um, the program counter. So it's heading down on a general route and you decide you want to go up here. It has to throw away an instruction or something like that. And the, the loss of time you'll see when we look at the waveform as it does this section right here. So we'll have uh, six really quick ups and downs and then a bit of a delay and then six really quick ups and downs. I guess it's actually down and up. And then we go. Okay, so anyhow, let's, um, let's program this and see what we get here. So right here, I'm going to compile my program by pushing this button here. We'll see how that works. And it goes through, compile. Oh, look at that. We've got some mistakes. So let's go back over here and figure out what I did wrong. Uh, it's not like the first time I've ever done anything wrong. Uh, um, so what is wrong with this? Um, I'm going to look really carefully here and we'll see if we can spot something. Have a look, everybody. 
And if anybody spots anything, let me know. <laughs> um, it's always nice to watch somebody solve problems live on unedited video. Isn't that amazing? Um, now, what was it here? Bit clear, bit set, bit clear, bit set, bit clear, bit set, bit clear. Go to loop and... Was there a problem with this? I didn't think there was. Um, actually looks pretty good. Got your end down here, go to loop. That seems good to me. Um, I don't really see a problem with this. Um, go run it again and figure out what we did here. Um, Build field. What was, um, I've seen this before. Um, and it's like, there's nothing wrong with the code, <laughs> but there's something wrong with the, um, what is it? There's something really funny. Um, right here. That's good. That's good. Um, this is all good in here. Does that look, oh wait, I forgot. Oh, you know what I did? When I cut the uh, code out, I actually forgot. I did not cut the whole thing up properly. Okay, so we're gonna just um, go back and, and grab the configuration bits. I made a mistake. Um, see, there's some stuff at the very top I missed. I recognize it as being not there. So I'm gonna <laughs> grab it again. It's in here in the set configuration bits. Um, we're just gonna grab that code again, generate the code again. And I'm going to Copy and paste. This time I've got all of it. So copy that. And let's go back here and back here and put it all right here. Paste. Much better. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See, I was missing this include statement. I, I noticed it was kind of missing. So um, that's all good. That's great. I can, I can close this up if I want. Um, that's good. Okay, now we'll see how it runs. Little hammer, push it, compile, and look at that. Isn't that amazing? Phew. Okay, now we want to uh, program that chip, which is sitting in a, um, well, on a breadboard tied to my PIC3, um, PIC kit thing, uh, programmer. So what I want to do is I want to add five volts to it. So I run over here. I go over here to project properties. I click on that. I run over here to PIC kit three. I run over to this thing right here and I click down to the power button and I see I need to click on this to give it five volts. I apply that. I say, okay, because without doing that, that um, pick kit three does not know to put five volts onto that chip. I think that's really stupid, but that's just um, the way it's been put together. Now it's got five volts on the programmer and the programmer is given five volts to the processor so it can be programmed that way. I'm now gonna click this little guy right here to put the program into that chip. And we wait for a little bit. It's gonna ask the question, do you actually have a low voltage or a high voltage chip? I can't believe this. They ask questions like this. Anyhow, it's a high voltage chip. A five volt chip really is what it is. It's, but it's not a 3.3 volt chip, which is an, it can usually be spotted by the L designation on the chip itself. Anyhow. Programming verified complete. Okay, so that chip's been programmed and verified. We're gonna now go to the um, the desk here, I think, and we'll have a look at what we have. I'm just gonna move my little camera over <laughs> uh, to here. Um, let's see what we're doing here. Um, we are gonna look at the camera and see what we've got here. Uh, where is this thing? Well, is that out of focus or what? Um, I think I'll leave it out of focus because it takes so much to fiddle around with. So that chip has been programmed right here. Um, I guess, okay, I'll focus it. Give me a second here. The properties of the video capture properties. I deactivated the um, some of the things. Configure video, camera control, focus. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? How sweet is that? 
Okay, so let me just get back out of here again. Um, so uh, I want to take that chip out of there and put it somewhere else. I'm going to use my fancy high-end tool here. I know. And I'm going to take the 40-pin chip and move it over to a whole different little board. Maybe this board here would be good. Yeah. And I'm going to put some stuff on there. So this is my chip, and I've actually got the power on it right now. Um, I need a, um, a push button. I think the push button was, was it pin 3? Of course it was. And of course, from pin 3 to ground, right? Is that about like that? Yeah. Um, maybe I'll pull this back a little bit so you can see how this is working here. So yeah, you can see the push button right there. Um, now I need my oscilloscope probe, which is right here. I will attach it to, um, well, it was gonna be bit zero, port A, which was pin two, right? And I'm gonna attach that right there, like that. And I think I'll actually just use the ground on the battery itself, like that. Okay, so when I push this button here, that, um, signal will be sent to the, uh, the probe, my oscilloscope probe. Okay, so let me uh, go back into, let me start up the, um, the, um, give me a second here. Start up my PC oscilloscope. <laughs> so yeah, here's a commercial. Buy some hand tech products. Great, thanks. Okay, so now I push the little button here and see all the chatter on there? I'm gonna just pause that chatter and we'll look at it. So that is um, 200 nanoseconds. So that is the waveform that's coming out of that. Um, just let it roll again. Now, as you can see, if I hit the button, like I just did now, or I release it, the waveform stops or continues. So I hit the waveform again, and that's what you get right there. I'll just stop it right there. So yeah, the long pause is when the, the program rerouted up to the top and went through um, its little trap. And it just took a little bit of time because that's how much time it actually takes to run through each step. So this is 100 nanoseconds per sections, I guess. So to go from here to about here, which would be considered one entire up and down, it goes down for a, a clear and all the way back up for a bit set. So that looks like it's gonna be about, um, would you say that's, um, oh, I don't know. Oh, that's actually 200 nanoseconds. So that's gonna be about 125 nanoseconds for that. Matter of fact, let me, I guess the frequency wouldn't really help <laughs> because it's got a really weird um, long spot right here, but anyhow, let's um, let it roll. So good luck trying to find the frequency on this. But yeah, it's somewhere around. Um, it says eight megahertz of frequency. It's probably eight megahertz. It's grabbing this right here. Anyhow, guys, thank you very much for going all the way through this video with me. We will talk to you guys later.